listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. And I'm Rachel. Today is a hymn sing with Sarah day. Yes. Yes. I love these. I'm excited for this one because this is one that I realized in our last hymn sing episode that I had not done an episode on the trust section of our Lutheran service book yet. And so this one has been in the works for a little while. And this section has a lot of really well-loved hymns. So that is super duper exciting. I, I lovingly call the trust section of the Lutheran service book the 700s because mm-hmm. that's how just how <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. But the 700s quote is the trust section and also the hope and comfort section. And I, I realized, and I think a lot of other people realized as they were filling out the poll, that we don't really know the difference between the trust section and the hope and comfort (laughs) section. We kind of mash them together. I was actually a little surprised that some of the hymns that I thought were in the trust section aren't because it's all the 700s, Mm -hmm. but it's two separate sections. There's 33 hymns in the trust section, and then I haven't counted the next ones. I'll probably do that section sometime this year. We have a different hymn sing coming up for our next hymn sing, but sometime Mm -hmm. this year, maybe I'll get to the rest of that hope and comfort section because that one has my favorite hymn, Jesus Priceless Treasure. So Mm -hmm. the way I think about the difference between these sections is if somebody is likely to request it at their funeral, it goes in hope and comfort. (laughs) Uh, Oh, maybe. Oh, yeah. That's where you get Amazing Grace. That's that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of of hymns that people want at their funerals go in hope and comfort. That's how I think of it. But maybe that's just me. Okay, but that's how you can define hope and comfort. But how do you define trust? Well, like how what what makes it in that it fits in what theme? But you wouldn't necessarily have it at your funeral. I don't know. I don't. mm. It's an argument from absence. I understand. Mm. Karen, you're right. And see the the difference is very very subtle. And quite honestly, Uh a lot of these could probably go either way. But like the trust, the trust section is very much about like we confess what God promises to provide us and they talk about what God's going to provide for us, how he forgives us, how he rescues us from death and the devil gives us eternal life, promises to always be with us. They yeah. they confess that nothing can separate us from God. So it, it's almost more of like these confessional hymns, if I can say that that way, of like saying what God, like the trust that we put in God for what he promises to give us. And the hope and comfort section, I think, is is like even more on the feelings side of the hymns. Like I was going to say this later. I'll just say it now. A lot of these hymns come from like the pietist movement. Hmm. There's not a lot of them that are like really hard hitting Lutheran doctrine. A lot of them are Lutheran hymn writers, but like not a ton of really hard hitting doctrine in these. It's a lot more mm-hmm. of of that comfort even though they're trust section stuff. But Hmm. I think the hope and comfort ones go even further into that of Hmm. ones that like when you really need to remember what God promises us, that's where you go for those. I don't know. Maybe I'm not even making a distinction. (laughs) It's subtle. Now, maybe as we continue on, it will find a thread that we can tie it together with. We'll see. Maybe when I actually do the hope and comfort section, we'll figure it out. (laughs) Or not, and we'll just confuse ourselves even more. So, yep, there's a reason this is one of the favorite sections in the hymnal, though. There's a whole lot of great hymns. There's 33 mm-hmm. of them. We've got Lord Thee I Love With All My Heart, which is definitely at least a top 10, if not a top five favorite hymn for me. The King of Love My Shepherd Is, The Lord's My Shepherd mm-hmm. I Shall Not Want, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us, which are favorites for Good Shepherd Sunday. Seek Ye First, From God Can Nothing Move Me, who trusts in God a strong abode, Jesus, Savior, pilot me. I walk in danger all the way. Eternal Father, strong to save. Maybe he- him. Woohoo! <laughs> right. <laughs> Jesus, lead thou on. I leave all things to God's direction. We walk by faith and not by sight. Lead me, guide me. Lord, take my hand and lead me. The Lord is my light. If God himself before me, that's a favorite one. Children of the Heavenly Father. I know that one's a favorite for a lot of people. Huh? Mm-hmm. Evening and morning, on eagle's wings. Mm-hmm. I will refrain from my commentary about firm a foundation. That would be wise. <laughs> I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus. What is the world to me? That's a, another, I know that one's a longtime favorite for a lot of people. Oh, God, forsake me not. 
all depends on our possessing our God. Oh, God, our help in ages past. I can't even say it right. When I sing it, I even sing it. Our God, our, our help. Oh, God, our help in ages past. I trust, O oh Lord, your holy name. Have no fear, little flock. Consider how the birds above rejoice. My heart be glad and sing. Lord of all hopefulness, precious Lord, take my hand. And I am Jesus, little lamb. Oh, so there's so many good ones. Of really great yeah. hymnody in here. And the votes on this poll were so spread out that there wasn't really like a clear winner that blew all the rest of them out of the water. There were some clear favorites that kind of rose to the top, but the votes were super spread out. And I think ladies added like another 30 hymns to this list. <laughs> this mm. was a non-maximum science poll. <laughs> Man. Which is fine. I encouraged everyone to add the hymns that they wanted. And ironically, a lot of the hymns that got added are from the next section of the hymnal. Yeah. So we will get to those eventually. But the top five, according to the Facebook group poll, were The King of Love My Shepherd Is, which yeah. barely nudged out Children of the Heavenly Father. They were, they were almost equal votes. So basically a tie for first. Those are both very excellent hymns. And then we had... I am trusting the Lord Jesus in second place. I am Jesus' little lamb in third place. And then Lord, thee I love with all my heart in fourth place. And quite honestly, I was surprised that one didn't show up higher. But maybe that's just me in my own little bubble that I love that hymn so much. I just assume everyone else does too. The competition know. was very strong. That is, <laughs> it, it was, that but is the other one, like that's like the, isn't that, that's the newest one. Like, because that wasn't in a previous hymnal. That was so... in TLH. Lord, thee I love with all my heart. Oh, okay. It was in it TLH. In LW then. Oh, you know, I didn't and look. So I have a oh, feeling that that means that for people like me who grew up mm -hmm. with LW, we didn't come to know and appreciate Lord, thee I love until a little later. And while it is beloved it is does it have quite as deep a roots in my soul that's well and the, that's a good point is one of the it's on that list it's the one that shows up mostly in lutheran hymnals mm -hmm. you know i yes. well i am jesus yeah. little lamb is another one that is distinctly lutheran but several of those others we will show up in other other church hymnals as well so if you weren't born lutheran you might still be True. familiar yeah. with these True. tunes it's yeah. hymns and love them that's true. I didn't realize that Lord the I Love wasn't in LW. That's a really good point. So, okay. Fair point. <laughs> I tell you, it's a magnificent hymn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. <laughs> huh. See, I learned something yeah. today. There we go. There were a lot of hymns with like zero votes. So there's kind of like this, this continuum of a big chunk that like everybody loves and there isn't really a clear favorite, but a lot of people love them. And then this whole other section of these trust hymns that like, I don't know. We just probably don't sing them or something. I don't know. They're great hymns, though. And a few of them, actually, I'm not even sure I've sung that much. So there's that, too. There were, like I said, a lot of hymns that were added to this list. So ones like Abide With Me, of course. Mm -hmm. If thou but trust in God to guide thee. Again, hope and comfort section. Mm -hmm. Oh God, O oh Lord of heaven and earth. That's a, a fair vote. Entrust your days and burdens. Also in the next section, God's Own Child, which I think makes it into literally every hymn poll because it's just a favorite hymn. And so people just use it for every occasion, which I think <laughs> is perfectly <laughs> fine. But let's yeah. see. Beautiful Savior, also in the next section. Jesus Priceless Treasure. So there's like a lot of people. We just kind of overlap all of these. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, that that's fine. The one that I very much appreciate the addition of, though, this is not actually in any of, any of our hymnals, I don't think. Thank you, Veronica Dembski is J.S. Box, Who Puts His Trust in God Most Just, which for Concordia Chicago people, Concordia Chicago music people, this is kind of like insider baseball. But if you were a musician at Concordia Chicago or, or did one of their music camps, this is the closing song for all the Wind Symphony concerts. Yeah. I got to play it at summer music camp back in high school when I played it there. My friends were, who are in Wind Symphony love this. And Doc Fisher just has this very iconic way of introducing this song he's he says who puts his trust in god most just and it's just we love it <laughs> it's fabulous if you know doc fisher he is amazing yeah. so okay. so anyway the whole point of this is that all of you ladies really love this trust hymnody whether it's in this section or the next one and there's so many wonderful hymns and 
I am mad. Uh, somehow I'm not going to talk about all 33 of them. I'm going to get close, but we would need like a snack and bathroom break if I did that. So there's snippets in a lot of these that are just very interesting. So we'll do a, a few snippets. But this first one, I was messaging you guys while I was writing this and I ended up falling down a researching a heresy that I sort of knew about in connected with this first hymn. So, oh dear. <laughs> This got really interesting really quickly. Man. So, Lord, thee I love with all my heart. I'm just going to start there. Uh, no. Heretical. No, 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 no. The no. hymn is not heretical. <laughs> okay. Thank you. No, no, no. The person who wrote it is connected with... Hold oh. on. I'll just tell you the story because... Okay. All right. All right. I, yeah. I, I, was, I, I was like, what? This is just a favorite hymn. How interesting could it be? Oh, it, it could get very interesting. So... <laughs> I will withhold judgment until you have told us the story. more, indeed. So I learned this hymn as TLH 429 way back in grade school. I don't remember why we started singing it, but it was very quickly a fan favorite in our music class. We sang it all the time. It took me a long time to switch my language over to the 708. Or I don't know if the language is different, but the, t the tune is different ever so slightly in LSB, and it got me confused for a long time. However... The setting that's in LSB is one of my absolute favorite settings of every hymn. Like, if you know this hymn, it's like it, you talk about basically being laid in the grave, right? And then, and then the organist pulls out all the stops and, and pushes a Zimbelstern button. And like, you get all of the noise and you're like, and then from death awaken me that these my eyes with joy may see. You're like, yell, singing and crying. And it's, you're like a hot mess, but it's amazing. And I love it. And there's a killer tenor line that I sing every time. And... As a treat, I did find a recording of this and got all secured all the copyright permissions and everything. So there's a recording of this at the end of the podcast if you keep listening. So oh, it's fabulous. So Rachel, you're right. This hymn isn't really known outside of Lutheranism. It's so powerful though that Bach uses stanza three mm -hmm. as the final chorus of his Saint John Passion, which I am currently rehearsing to sing during Holy Week with American Contrai. So it's this really incredibly powerful third stanza that you know the organ is pulls out all the stops for. This is where it gets interesting. So this hymn was written by Martin Schalling, who lived 1532 to 1608, not during the Thirty Years' War. However, <laughs> <laughs> it was part of this second wave of Reformation poets, like Philip Nicolai was also in this group. They lived through and sometimes died in this very tumultuous confessional conflict and, and violent time for them persecution and suffering for your beliefs was super duper real for them at this time. So Schalling studied to be a pastor in Wittenberg, and then he went to Regensburg in 1554 for his first call. And he had to choose immediately between opposing the Flacian, am I saying that right? Flacian heresy? I'm to sure remain that's with not the Germans say it. Flacian. Or his livelihood. So basically he had to be like, do you... Do you want to oppose this heresy or will you subscribe to the heresy so you can keep your job? Like that's he had to choose to remain faithful or be forced to leave. So the Flacian fallacy, I have to explain this now because I didn't know what it was. I'm like, OK, well, why is this so bad? Well, Matthias Flacius was a Kinesio Lutheran and these guys followed Flacius against the Philippists who followed Melanchthon and Flacius and his followers accuse the Philippists of synergism, that we cooperate in our salvation, which obviously we don't, and the influence of Calvinism in the Lord's Supper. But Flacius's issue is that he went too far with his understanding of original sin, that the substance of man is destroyed by original sin and man's nature is identical to sin, and in conversion a new substance is created by God. But we believe that God made man in his image and while we lost the image of God to a certain degree in the fall, we don't lose our substance as man. The substance of man is good. Sin corrupted the nature but not, did not destroy the substance. And Flacian was also accused of Manichaeism, which boils basically down to dualism. Like there's a good God and an evil God. They both have creating power. The evil God made man with sin. Obviously, this is not true. God is the creator. He created a good world, which then sin corrupted. So. That's Flacian heresy, Flacian fallacy. And Schalling refuted all of that. He's like, mm, no, that's not right. And so he got kicked out. He had to leave. So then he went to Amberg, and again, he had to defend his adherence to true doctrine. 
the ruler, Elector Frederick III, who basically went from Catholic to Lutheran to Calvinist, mm-hmm. pressured Schalling to accept Calvinism. And he wouldn't. Schalling's like, nope, not a Calvinist, sorry. So the council in that town was Lutheran and tried to defend him, but Elector Friedrich III finally forced their hand, and Schalling was forced to leave during Holy Week in 1569. Like, that's, that's just cruel. cruel. Yeah. But the elector's brother, Count Richard of the Palatinate, gave him refuge, and Schalling preached for them on Easter Sunday, 1569. So that's where this hymn comes in. Long story, not very short. The sermon and this hymn actually survive in his handwriting. And the hymn connects to the text of his sermon, which is the preparation for the Passover in Exodus 12, 1 to 14. Like, we got to be ready for God to come, basically. So the hymn isn't really an Easter hymn, but it makes those connections to the Passover in the hymn. Kind of cool. And that is kind of a wider connection of Schalling and this time period of the second wave of reformers. A lot of the hymns that come out of this second wave have really similar themes so like the first one of faith hope and faith are only found in christ because he is the only constant death is never far away from our in our sin-stricken world god's sacramental presence is here in real and true presence not just spiritually we pray urgently for god's strength because we face real strong threats against our faith and Death is the portal to eternal life with Christ, and our hope shines from the future glory to come. So you can hear all of those themes in this hymn and in other hymns that were written during this second wave. And, I mean, this hymn is just jam-packed with theology and biblical references, and obviously it's going to be in my funeral hymn sing. That's just a given. So (laughs) I will be having a hymn sing for my funeral. That's also just a given. Yes, of course. (laughs) And I'm almost done with this one. But before we move on, a note that Catherine Winkworth translated this one along with a lot of other ones in this Mm -hmm. section because she translated like everything. But the version that we have first appeared in her chorale book for England in 1863, although an earlier different version was in Lyrica Germanica in 1858. So this hymn is also the hymn of the day for Lent. Two in the three-year lectionary, which when this podcast drops would have been last Sunday. So y'all are like fresh off of singing this hymn as your hymn of the day for Lent too. And it's also for Proper 21 in Series C lectionary and Trinity 19 in the one-year lectionary. So we do get to sing this throughout the church year. And it's really common for funerals, which is why it'll make me cry during stanza three. And stanza three is actually quoted in the Commendation of the Dying in the LSB agenda and the pastoral care companion which i didn't know so that's kind of cool we love this hymn so sarah after saying that with such confidence i retract my statement that it wasn't an lw it is an lw oh however they retranslated it or something it's super awkward oh so i think we just didn't sing it because it they wanted lw they didn't like these and thighs and all of that it would and be to weird. get around with, like, to get away from that, they had to make some awkward choices. Yeah. And anyway, so I, I have a feeling that's why I didn't, we didn't grow up singing. I didn't grow up singing it because it's, it's just, it doesn't flow well in LW, in my opinion. Yeah. That or who knows, maybe just the pastor was just oh. like, I don't like that one. So he just <laughs> never picked it. You know what? That's there. Yeah, there are hymns opinions. that fall by the wayside. Yep. Yeah. And then somebody rediscovers mm-hmm. them and yeah. suddenly we all yeah. love it. And we're like, why would I exactly. always sung this exactly. hymn? Exactly. Right. Then, no. For me, that falls into that category. I don't think yeah. I if I heard this hymn, I did not even notice it or pay attention to it yeah. until I was already probably late 20s, early 30s. Oh, yeah. That was when my husband discovered Mm. it and he loved it. And then you watch your husband cry when he's singing a hymn and you're like, (laughs) I should pay attention to the words. Oh, my goodness, this is beautiful. How come I never noticed this? Yeah. For me, it was Pastor Whedon at the IC Chapel. He was our our IC chaplain for a number of years and he loved the hymn. So he Mm -hmm. picked it a lot. So we sang it a lot. And so I came to I came to love it there from work and. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. It's it's mm. interesting how these things come into your life. 
Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. All right. So that's the longest story we're going to yeah. have on any okay. of these hymns today. I just All had right. to dig into that one even more. So now we're going to go a little faster. Okay. <laughs> so 713 from God Can Nothing Move Me. Notice I skipped a few because I told you I'm not doing all 33 of these. If you want to be a great hymn writer, we have said this before, you will likely have some suffering in your life. Truth. This has come up several times. So this hymn came about because a plague struck Erfurt in 1563 and the rector of the university and his wife, Pancratius and Regine Helbig, managed to escape the city. And their friend and fellow lecturer at the university, Ludwig Helmboldt, wrote this text to give them strength during this perilous journey. And his inspiration came from Psalm 73, verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. And the first publication of this in 1563 as a broadsheet had this dedication to Regine Helbig, who was also the godmother of Ludwig Helmboldt's oldest daughter. So these guys, I mean, they were like besties. It was published in a collection in Nuremberg in 1569. And while a lot of other hymnals use Catherine Winkworth's translation, of course, LSB uses Gerald Thorson's translation, and he translated it for L- LBW. So we have seven of the nine original stanzas, and four of them are so heavily altered for LSB that they're basically new translations. So that's okay. the story of that hymn. It's a great one. 714, who trusts in God a strong abode. This is just a quick note. Again, Erfurt, a lot of these hymns come from like a small circle of people. I noticed the further I went. The first stanza was written by another pastor in Erfurt, Joachim Magdeburg, for a collection of hymns on family piety in 1572. And then it was in a Lutheran hymn book in the 1590s. And he was also wrapped up in this Flacian heresy. But he agreed with Flacius' view of original sin and the substance of the fallen sinner, which alienated him from the majority of Lutherans. So, didn't think you'd hear so much about heresy in him <laughs> saying about trust hymns. I but did not. <laughs> it's this weird, like, little circle of people. Everybody keeps showing up in all of these hymns. It's very interesting. So, Jesus, Savior, pilot me. This is one that, like, I kind of was very meh about it until I heard Jonathan Kors' rendition of it, arrangement of it. A few years. I don't remember when he wrote that. It was recently in, in the last several years. I love I the, the tune in the hymnal is OK, but I love Chorus's arrangement of it. It's just so like wavy, watery. You can't see what I'm doing with my hands. Mm-hmm. Podcast people, but mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just wonderful. Go find it on YouTube. Maybe I'll remember to put it in the show notes. But this was written by Edward Hopper, who lived 1816 to 1888. He was a Presbyterian minister at the Church of Sea and Land in New York City, and it's the only hymn that he wrote that's still in use. So we have three of his original six stanzas. The omitted ones leaned super heavily into this nautical theme, so we just left them out. Honestly, I just I love this hymn also now because the older I get, the more the stories about Jesus calming the storms just kind of blow my mind like more and more. Like Jesus is sitting on a boat and he just like tells nature what to do. Like obviously he can because he's God, but also the more I think about it, the more it bursts my brain, which is awesome. So I really love this hymn for that for that reason. And this is an English language original hymn, and we've talked about this before. How hymns that are just, are written in English just have a little extra zazz to them because they're written with the poetry that they're meant to have. So the more I sing it, the more I love it. Well, and, and I think I actually I do love this hymn. I've I rarely sing it. I don't think I've ever actually sung it in a Lutheran church. Oh. And one of the reasons for this, well, one is that the rhythm's a little strange if you've never heard it. But the other one is a lot of my experience in Lutheran churches has been in the Midwest. (laughs) Yeah. And I feel like this is a hymn you appreciate a whole lot more if you live within easy distance of the ocean and maybe spend a lot of your time in boats. Yeah. Yeah. That if, if you're... But the only oceans around you are amber waves of grain. <laughs> You're probably not going to love this hymn as much as you would if you've ever been out on the sea when That's the water fair. was a little rough That's fair. and yeah. had a little doubt about whether your safety will be completely assured. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a I, I think it's a, a regional thing, perhaps. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah. It hits differently when you're like, there's just trees around me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
the next 1717 Eternal Father Strong to Save, another nautical one. And we talked about it in the Patriotic yeah. Hymn Sing mm-hmm. episode, which I have a whole bunch of other episodes to link in the show notes because we've already talked about a lot of these <laughs> hymns. But this is one of Rachel's favorites, too. So mm-hmm. it is. I'm, I think I am actually legally and contractually obligated to have this as one of my favorites since it yeah. gets a lot of play in the Navy chaplaincy world for mm-hmm. good reason. Yes. Yep. Yep. I sing it a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. So then 718, Jesus lead thou on. We just love 24 stanza hymns around here, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> we <Royal> do. We. <laughs> <laughs> this hymn is actually a combination of two hymns written by Nicholas Ludwig von, von Zinzendorf, who also comes up again later. He, See, even he didn't write it with 24 stanzas. No, he didn't. He really didn't. He, von Zinzendorf lived 1700 to 1760. He comes up again later in another story. Three stanzas are from his 11 stanza hymn. And then one stanza is from a 15 stanza hymn. And then Christian Gregor combined them and reduced them from 24 to four stanzas in 1778. Uh, Thanks, Christian. uh, My (laughs) hero. Impressive. It is impressive. (laughs) And so this is a a fun fact, little rabbit trail. One of the ladies in the lounge messaged me and she was like, I have a legend to tell you about this hymn. I was like, please do. So... She wanted to remain anonymous. That's why I'm not saying her name. She says, take this for what it is, unconfirmed legend at this point. Her grandfather immigrated from Germany in 1929. He told her sister and her and her family about the wedding of a German princess to a Russian prince. And this was not a happy wedding or marriage. She absolutely said that she would not walk down the aisle unless the processional hymn being sung was Jesu ke Foran in German, which is this hymn. And so she walked down the aisle Two, Jesus lead thou on till our rest is won. And although the way be cheerless, we will follow calm and fearless. Put us by thy hand to our fatherland. (laughs) A little passive aggressive there. (laughs) So the faith of this young girl who could see heaven as her home, who was forced or enticed to give up her homeland Germany. It was also one of one of our lady's grandfather's favorite hymns. And so huh. her sister teaches history and they have presumed this to be the later Catherine the Great, formerly Sophia of Germany. There are other instances of German nobility marrying Russian nobility, but our, the, our lady listener would love to confirm that this was Sophia slash Catherine, but alas, her wedding was in the mid 1700s and it's a bit sketchy to get their musical mm. selections. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to say it actually probably wasn't Catherine the Great because she actually learned Russian, converted to Russian Orthodoxy before she was married mm-hmm. um, and was pretty excited, not about marrying her husband, who was apparently <laughs> a total jerk, but about, you know, giving up her German identity and becoming fully Russian. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so okay, very, another the, the one. fatherland doesn't doesn't quite ring, but I'm yeah. sure there were a lot of German princesses who got married to. Yeah. A lot of different people. Yeah. um, Because there were a lot of little German kingdoms and duchies and whatnot. Yep. So I'm not saying the story wasn't true, but it would surprise me if it was Catherine the Great. Yeah. Yeah. I sort of have this like in my mind as I'm like picturing this now as like a movie or something. I'm imagining that like (laughs) she's like drawn the line. She's like, it will be this him. And so like then like her parents are having strong words with the organist. They're like, this is the hymn, but you are going to make this sound joyful. And so he, he's like working so hard to make this sound like this super, super upbeat, joyful thing with the with the contrasting words that she insisted upon. Oh, I don't know. I love it. Anyway. I love the legend. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I will like this hymn a whole lot more. I mean, I've always liked it, but uh-huh. having this story in my mind, it will make me smile every time I sing it. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Next, we have two hymns by Salomo Frank. He's come up before in something. We have 719, I Leave All Things to God's Direction, and 731, Oh God Forsake Me Not. And when I look at these, I'm like, oh, yeah, they're great hymns. However, mm-hmm. oh, these are both translated by August Krull, who was a fantastic translator in early Lutheranism. So he's come up before because he collaborated with Bach. And when uh-huh. I mentioned his name to my husband, Luther, he's like, oh, yeah, of course, Salomo Frank. 
like, duh, of course you know. <laughs> but Frank was an established poet by the time Bach became concertmaster in Weimar. And Frank wrote nearly all of the librettos for Bach's cantatas between 1714 and 1717, except for two. So that's, I wow. did not bother with the math, but that is a lot of cantatas in three it's years. It's a lot of cantatas. Yeah. What does that and mean have, he wrote oh, the librettos? Rhymes. Is that like he wrote the words? Yeah. Oh, okay. Got it. Yep. Yep. You wrote the words. cantata. I just love this. A lot <laughs> of cantata. I'm going to say that A lot that of cantatas. Day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. After Bach left Weimar, he kept using other texts by Frank for his existing, like filling out his existing cantatas and also for making new ones. And Frank's M.O. was that he had very high literary quality and also very rich theological integrity. Which mm. I mean, Bach would have had nothing it's less a solid than that. Solid combo. So, yeah, yeah. I keep forgetting that little tidbit, but that's super duper cool. So I'll have to pay more attention to the text when I sing those next. <laughs> and then, and then we have seven twenty four. If God Himself before me, seven twenty six. Evening and morning, and seven thirty seven. Rejoice my heart, be glad and sing. I have two words for these hymns: Paul Gerhardt. <laughs> Mike Basically, drops. all I have to say about them. <laughs> of course. They're fantastic. Go sing them. Read them. They're, I believe they're all public domain. They should be. So you can go to like hymnary.org if you don't have a hymnal and just read the text. Because Gerhardt's texts are all very devotional on purpose. So they're very good to just read through them as part of your devotions too. So 725, Children of the Heavenly Father. Rachel talked about this one in a previous episode in our Great Moments in Lutheran Lady History for our two-year anniversary, which feels like ages ago. I know. I forgot completely that I'd ever done this. I <laughs> should probably go back and re-listen to that episode because I don't remember any of the story I told. So. <laughs> yeah, I talked about Lena Sandell. So. Lena Sandell. All right. Yeah. 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 So I also have that link for the show notes, too. If everybody feels like going and listening to a bunch more episodes, there's, there's several that we're going to link today. The next one, 727 on Eagle's Wings. Honestly, I have to. Mm, this is just not one of my favorites. I probably have several it's a reasons. Rare, it's a rare statement. I know. It's not. Mm -hmm. I just yeah. don't like it. But also, I'm not going to say any more about this one because I have an upcoming hymn sing on psalm paraphrases. And this uh, one is a psalm paraphrase. It so is. It's a psalm I'm just procrastinating. For that one. Admit it. Uh -huh. I'm just kicking the can down the road. It's true. <laughs> so we'll come back to that one later this year in that next I season. really like it. <laughs> Wait, do you? I do, wow. actually. Controversy. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, but I still love you, my friend. I we can, say, we, we can, can still have be differing friends. perspectives mm -hmm. on this song. Yeah, I think, fine. honestly, it's more of the tune than the text. Okay. So, but anyway, we'll talk about, we'll get into that controversy later. <laughs> <laughs> 728, how firm a foundation. No one really knows who wrote this. So that's really? fun. Yeah. The huh. author is just written as K in its original publication in John Rippon's A Selection of Hymns from the Best Authors in London in 1787. Rippon's collection was super popular in America and was published four times between 1792 and 1804. And so when I was going through the hymnal, like flipping through, singing all these in my head, I was like, huh, is this a shape note one? You could totally sing this as shape note. Turns out it is actually a shape note. <laughs> it's from Joseph Funk's A Compilation of Genuine Church Music from Virginia in 1832. And the melody is in the middle of the three voices, like it is when you do shape note stuff. You got the melody mm -hmm. in the middle and you got the voices above and below it. I love shape note. It's just so raw and wonderful. It's lovely. I should probably do a hymn sing on shape note at some point. Should. I don't really I'm know. I'm not what sure it there's is. enough in the hymnal to. That's fair. There's probably two or three. Short maybe. Episode. A five minute yeah, episode. Up every now and then. It's not going to be five up and it's don't even, don't even kid Ooh, yourself. Oh, I could do one on like early American yeah. tunes though. That, that would, would include... be very good. You should do that. <sighs> Those um, are so. Um, stay tuned. Fall 2024. After Vaughn Williams. Three. The early American. Five. Folky tunes are probably my favorite. But anyway, that's a different <laughs> rabbit hole. Deathless 29, I am trusting the Lord Jesus. This one made the favorites list. It's written by 
the evangelical Anglican Francis Havergal. And we have four writ- hymns written by her in Lutheran service book. This one, obviously. And then 527, O Savior, Precious Savior. 783, Take My Life and Let It Be. Like, that's super popular. I love that. And hymn. the famous 887, Now the Light Has Gone Away. So mm-hmm. she has written some of, I mean, at least in my childhood, I grew up singing a lot of Francis Havergal. And her hymns emphasize this personal devotion and surrender to God because she's an evangelical Anglican. She wanted more experience and feeling in the church, which we don't really super emphasize in most of our Lutheran <laughs> circles. <laughs> um, but that was Small really doses. important to her. Right, right. This hymn was among <laughs> her favorites, though. A copy of it was in her pocket Bible when she died in 1879. Mm. So I think you it's can beautiful. have a favorite of your own hymns. That's, that's allowed. Yeah. Sure. Seven. 32. All depends on our possessing. Again, another one that nobody really knows when or by whom this text was written. It just kind of like appeared. Somebody wrote it. The earliest printing was in the Nuremberg Hymnal in 1676 by Anonymous. So Catherine Winkworth, however, (laughs) translated it for her Lyrica Germanica in 1858. And her translations, as we've talked about somewhere, I don't know, along the way, She translates things with a lot of subjective language, focusing more on feelings. Hmm. And the text we have in LSB is altered to take most of that language out and make it much more objective and focused on God instead of us. Oh, there's that. Catherine also wrote with like the virtues of the romantic mindset of her time. And that language was also replaced in LSB with better, quote, Lutheran language. So this hymn has been Lutheranized. (laughs) Too touchy-feely. Fix it. (laughs) Basically, yes. So the funny (laughs) part, (laughs) the fun part about this, though, is that this hymn has actually been in every Missouri Synod hymnal from CFW Walther's Kirchen Gesangbuch für Evangelisch Lusches Gemeinden über uh, Ungender. Augsburg. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> Better wish to confession the um. in hymnal. In 1847, and then the <laughs> first English hymnal in 1912 with Catherine Winkworth's translation, because so you can read it in that old, old hymnal from 1912. And then TLH in 1941, and then LW, and then LSB. So huh. it has been in all of our hymnals, which is kind of fun. I don't that know that there's a many. lot of... Yeah, no. there's not a ton that have probably been in every single hymnal. So, 733. Oh, God, our help in ages past, which I always say wrong. This is a classic Isaac Watts. He's written so many hymns also. It's the hymn of the day for a day of national or local tragedy, which I did not know had appointed hymns of the day. But there you have it. It's also a paraphrase of Psalm 90. So I will also come back to this one in the upcoming Psalm paraphrases episode, along with the next one in the hymnal, 734, I trust, O Lord, your holy name. That one's also a psalm paraphrase. So kicking a lot of cans down the road today. Okay. <laughs> next, <laughs> have no fear, little flock, 735. This is a jazz hymn in our hymnal. I had no idea. It was like purposefully jazzy. So Heinz Werner Zimmerman, born in 1930, wrote this hymn in jazz style. And he wrote really? it based on, yeah. I mean, it's got like, it's got the syncopated rhythm thing going on, which is fun. He based it on Luke 12, 32. And then Marjorie Jilson, who lived 1931 to 2010 and was a Detroit area person, yes, wrote the remaining stanza. So it's a fun modern hymn that also packs a theological punch. And it is a Lutheran hymn. CPH commissioned Marjorie Jilson to write the rest of the stanzas. So pretty cool. I did not know any of that. 736, consider how the birds above another modern hymn because Stephen Starkey wrote the text to this one. And this one, I really, I've always loved the text. I mean, always, as long as it's been in our hymnal, love the text for this because it's based on Luke 12, 24 to 31, where Jesus is teaching his disciples about worry. The whole, like, if God clothes the lilies of the field, how much more will he care for you? And I love that. I just love that part. So it's brilliant. It's a beautiful hymn. 739, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. This is a favorite across denominations and in popular music. It's one of the great religious songs of the past century. 
It's been sung in a lot of times of national mourning. Gospel singer Mahalia Jackson performed it in 1968 at the funeral of Martin Luther King Jr. And opera singer Leontine Price sang it in 1973 at the state funeral of President Lyndon Johnson. So this has been a very popular hymn for a lot of people in a lot of different times. And for good reason that it's sung in times of tragedy. Fair warning, this is a sad story. Thomas Andrew Dorsey lived 1899 to 1993. He moved from Georgia to Chicago in 1916 and had a really amazing career as an arranger, a blues pianist, a jazz band leader, and a recording artist. He's actually called the father of gospel music for blending the secular and sacred worlds of music and creating the first gospel songs. We and should try- clarify here because I was confused about this for a while. Thomas Dorsey, not the same as Tommy Dorsey, the jazz trombonist. Ah, good yeah. point. Yes, yes. So he tried to market this gospel music to local churches and ministers, and it wasn't really working. So he actually yeah. published it on his own and sold it on street corners, and he was super successful doing that. And then in 1931, the Reverend J. H. L. Smith at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Chicago invited Dorsey to play for services, and the effect was so great that Reverend Smith had church members organize under Dorsey's leadership for the next Sunday, and this was essentially the first gospel choir in America, which is super cool. So then the next year, he was appointed director at the historic Pilgrim Baptist Church in Chicago, and he served there for 40 years. Wow. So he had a really great legacy of gospel music in Chicago. I mean, it affected like everybody everywhere. He's really talented. This is the sad part, though. In August 1932, he was playing at a revival here in St. Louis, actually. And he learned that his wife, Nettie, had died in childbirth. And then his newborn son died shortly after he returned to Chicago. So like horrible personal tragedy. But that tragedy was his inspiration to write Precious Lord out of this Mm -hmm. immense grief Mm -hmm. and trust in God. So I will now be remembering that story every time I sing this. The feeling in it is so... This is a song I sing by myself, Mm -hmm. belting it out when I'm having just one of those days where I just can't go on Mm -hmm. anymore. It is really powerful. And you can tell that it comes from a place of of genuine honesty and faith. Yeah. 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 That, That certainly makes me appreciate what the hymn is saying even more. So... Finally, the last one, 740, I am Jesus' little lamb. Of course, this is a huge favorite for people of all generations. We all sing this one. It was written by Henrietta Louise von Hein, who lived 1724 to 1782. And she first published it in Barbie in 1778 by Christian Greger, who has showed up once before in this podcast. He's the one that took the 24 stanzas and whittled them down to four. Funny, (laughs) he's already a favorite. Funny how a lot of the same people keep showing up in this section. So after straying from the faith after her confirmation, the Holy Spirit worked through Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf, also showed up before, a leader of the pietist movement in the Moravian Church and the United Brethren to bring her back into the church. She worked as a teacher, teaching schoolgirls and caring for the invalid sisters in the community. So she was also influenced by a lot of people that brought her back into the church. And she was like caring for these children as lambs of Jesus. So Mm. there you go. I do find it interesting. I mentioned this at the beginning that a lot of these hymns come from this pietist movement. I don't know if there's like coincidence or a reason why. I just I was noticing that as (laughs) writing all of this down. (laughs) Just an interesting fact. So yeah. What do I know you guys have been commenting the whole time, but do you have other do you have favorites in this section? Other than what you've already said. I have many favorites in this section. Honestly, I Am Jesus' Little Lamb is probably, it's probably the first hymn that I memorized. Mm -hmm. Because we sang it as a bedtime song when I was growing up. So that's probably the first one. But there there are a number of them from the section that, that are dearly loved. I'll tell you, though, that when you were asking about favorite hymns in with the topic of trust, What came to my mind is it's not a hymn from this section. And honestly, it's not the whole, it's not the whole hymn. It's just the one verse from, it's a communion hymn from here. Oh, my Lord, I see thee face to face. That's a good one. 
And it's, I have no help but thine, nor do I need another arm but thine to lean upon. It is enough, my Lord, enough indeed. My strength is in thy might, thy might alone. So that's what popped into my mind as far as like a hymn about trust. The idea that that's, he's all I have, all I need, and it's Mm -hmm. enough. Yeah. So, yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. I also love I Am Jesus' Little Lamb. It's my dad sang it to me when I was little, and I have sung it as a lullaby to all my kids when they were tiny. Mm-hmm. Like, it just, mm-hmm. it's a it's a beautiful song and a wonderful way to help small children learn to trust their Savior. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I still sing it to myself sometimes. Same. I also really love Lord Thee I Love with All My Heart. Mm-hmm. The poetry in that is so gorgeous. Yeah. And as I mentioned, precious Lord, take my hand. I think of, even though there are so many songs in this that are really precious to me, those are probably the three that I personally sing the most when I don't even have to. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. just a really, really great selection of songs. And I'm, I'm grateful to the folks who put our hymn together yeah. that they put them all in there. Yeah. We are really blessed. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. So many good ones. A lot of favorites. And like I mentioned, the recording that you'll hear at the end, if you keep listening through the disclaimer, the recording is the Concordia Seminary Choir that I was actually a part of in 2021. So this was during pandemic. Uh, Dr. Marriott, Dr. Jim Marriott, who was at the seminary at that time, pulled together a group of people and we just kind of recorded some hymns and put them on YouTube because people needed that at that time. So I I got permission to pull the audio from that video. So that is at the end of this podcast you can hear the awesome tenor line and he pulls the Zimbelstern on stanza three and like even just listening to it it just it gives me chills i love it it's just so good so ladies the poll is still up in the lounge but you can also just share your favorites if you have favorite hymns in this section also or stories about some of these hymns you can share them in the comments when this episode posts in our facebook group the lutheran ladies lounge or also on our instagram page We'll share this this episode on our Instagram page and some posts about hymnody the rest of the week. So you can comment on that as well at Lutheran Ladies Lounge on Instagram. You can sign up for our e-newsletter and the show notes for this episode, or you can send us an email, lutheranladies at kfuo.org. You can find all of our podcasts at kfuo.org slash Lutheran Ladies Lounge or on your favorite podcasting app or on the KFUO radio app. You are listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. And I'm Rachel. Views and opinions expressed on the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO Radio, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. The Lutheran Ladies Lounge is produced by KFUO Radio and available at kfuo.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and leave a review for us, too. If you love the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast, consider financially supporting our producer, KFUO Radio, so we can keep doing what we do. Find out how at kfuo.org give.